Hello, everyone. My name is Gabriel Borner. I'm here presenting IKO uh, 2021. We thank everyone uh, for the for the for the present attention on the, um, this panel. Um, we would like to to thank um, the to thank Yaromir, to thank Hannes, to thank Nicholas, and to thank uh, thank Adriana for their presentations to, um, at this moment. Um, we will begin with. Um, Yaromir and Hans, um, um, I'll, I'll, I will let them present themselves. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Uh, I'll ask Hans to share his screen. Yeah. Can you see it? All right. Welcome, um, everyone. Uh, Can we see it? Yaromir, sorry. Um, I just like to. First, you you could maybe present yourselves, and then I, I could uh, uh, you could begin your your presentation. I just need to thank our sponsors. Just mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, all right. So so the first presentation will be delivered by uh, Hannes Westerman from the Cyber Justice Laboratory at the uh, University of Montreal, and myself. My name is Jeremy Savelka, and I'm from the Carnegie Mellon. Okay. Um. Well. In name of the IKL organization, I just like to thank our uh, Splatman sponsors, just Brazil and uh, Albert Einstein Israeli Hospital, our GOAT sponsors, Logarithm, Legal Code, and PG Lawyers, and our silver sponsors, Urbano Vitalino Lawyers, uh, Opsibloom Lawyers, and Oasis Open. Um, uh, now, I'm sorry, guys, now you can begin your presentations. That's just um, bureaucracy, but let's, let's begin it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, All right. I see my screen now. Great. Yes. Welcome everyone to the presentation of Lex Rosera, which is a work on transferring predictive models among different contexts, uh, such as languages, jurisdictions, and legal domains. Uh, as you can see, this work is a joint effort of a sizable team of researchers in machine learning, computer science, and law coming from many different institutions. And as I already said, uh, this presentation will be delivered by Hannes and myself. So in this work, uh, we investigate the task of segmenting adjudicatory decisions in two parts, such as the background of the case, the analysis, or its outcome. We specifically identify the task that is general and fits different contexts. By that, I mean different types of decisions from different legal domains, even countries and legal systems, which also means the decisions can be in different languages. We use this task to evaluate the effectiveness of pre-trained multilingual embeddings to transfer a trained machine learning model across such contexts. Uh, we release the task type schema definition, the annotated data set, as well as all the code we used in our experiments to the public. So why are we doing this? Well, I think what you often see in machine learning um, is that the model is trained and evaluated on data with the same distribution. So there's some data set that is assembled, such as from legal cases, often, for example, from the same jurisdiction or in the same language. This is then split into a training and a test portion. And the training portion is used to train the model. Then the testing portion is used to evaluate the performance of the model. But this doesn't always tell us about how well the model will generalize. Um, what happens if we give it a new unseen data set? because the model might have learned some specific particularity of the data set it was trained on that will still work well when applied against this testing model, a testing data set, but when it is used in practice, perhaps the data looks different and the model might just work very badly on this new data. So here we investigate whether it is possible to build models that generalize between different contexts. And as Jeremy mentioned, by context, we mean different languages, different jurisdictions, and different legal domains. So we identify the task um, that is relevant across many such contexts. And the task that we chose was to segment legal decisions into different portions. First, uh, the segment of the background, where the facts um, are introduced, then the analysis, where a judge would discuss these facts and apply legal rules, and finally the outcome, where it states the results of this. And here you can see a human annotated decision uh, from the Czech Republic um, that has been annotated with these segments. But this kind of type schema works across many different contexts. So here, for example, is a decision um, of employment um, 
dispute from the United States that has also been annotated by a human with these same categories. So what we can do now is that we can take data and from one context, train a model with this, and then evaluate how well it performs on data from another context. So for example, um, what we've done here is that we've taken a model that is trained exclusively on data from the Czech Republic, and then we've used that model to segment this decision from the United States. And here you see the results of this. So this is purely generated by a machine, the, these segments, that has never before seen any decision in English and has never before seen a decision in um, labor law, but it rather has been trained on decisions from the Czech Republic from various different courts. And as you can see, it still works pretty well. And I think this is pretty remarkable. What we're really doing here is that we train a model on data from the Czech Republic, and then we evaluate it against data from the United States that is never seen before, fully unseen data. But despite this, we achieve a weighted F1 score of 0.86. So that is one of the things we evaluate here. But we also look at what happens if we pool multiple such data sets together. So what if we add additional context to data from the Czech Republic and evaluate that against data from the United States? And what happens if we use all of our data set as a pool for training? Um, will that um, and include also data from the target context? So the United States in this case, will that further improve performance? I think this could have pretty interesting implications here. First, it could allow the creation of really robust and generalizable models. That is models that you could deploy uh, in a real world scenario and it would work across many data from many with different distributions, different languages and from different contexts. It could also allow the rapid adaptation of models to new contexts. You could start with a model that has already been trained um, and that works pretty well on, on your target context and then fine tune it a bit to make it work really well. That's probably much quicker than training it from scratch. And finally, it enables this international collaboration of researchers, since researchers can annotate their own data set and contribute to a common pool that is then useful to all the different researchers across many different countries. All right, <clears throat> let us speak about the data set. So as already mentioned, the first step in creating the data set was a definition of the type schema. Uh, this definition is expressed in detailed annotation guidelines, and of course, these are also available in the project repository. Uh, the type schema includes types such as out of scope. So these are parts outside of the main document body, for example, metadata and editorial content, maybe endnotes, appendices, and such. Uh, also headings. Uh, these are fairly straightforward. So for the purposes of our experiments here, uh, we removed the out-of-scope content and headings, which only left us with background analysis and outcome. Uh, background uh, is the part where the court describes procedural history, relevant facts of the case, and so on. Analysis is the section that contains reasoning of the court, is issue, maybe applicable law. Uh, and finally, outcome are the few sentences uh, stating how the case was decided. It is worth mentioning that by removing headings uh, from the texts, we have made this task more difficult. Right? There are some domains where headings are suggestive about the beginning of a certain part. Uh, however, this is not a general rule. And what we wanted to do is to make sure that the models we train will focus on the meaning of the text to, rather than on superficial cues, such as the presence of a heading. Uh, reliance on such cues would have almost certainly resulted uh, in models that are very brittle and would prevent a successful transfer among different contexts. Now, uh, after learning the types definition and participating in the training, uh, the authors split into eight teams where the goal of each team was to assemble a data set of approximately 100 documents. The authors could create such data set in whatever way they wanted. The only constraint really was that each sub data set needs to contain decision documents that are in the same language. The aim was to obtain collections of documents that would be quite different when compared to each other. We needed this in order to investigate the transfer capabilities of the multilingual embeddings. Uh, to give you a more precise idea of the differences among those subsets, let us look at some of them more closely. First of all, it's apparent that they come from different countries and the documents are very often written in different languages. For example, the German subset is a stratified sample from the federal jurisprudence database spanning all federal courts such as civil, criminal, labor, administrative, and many more types of court. 
On the other hand, one of the USA subsets, it's a very specialized selection of federal district court decisions in employment law, mentioning the term motion for summary judgment, employee, and independent contractor. So a very, very narrowly specified domain. Overall, the data set consists of 807 cases coming from seven different countries that are written in six different languages. There are almost 90,000 sentences annotated with one of the types from the schema presented earlier. As already mentioned, uh, the data set including the type schema definition is available in a publicly accessible repository. To give you a bit more insight uh, into the data we operate on in this work, let us look at this graph. First of all, notice that we did not use the out of scope and heading sentences in our experiments here. This reduces the size of the data set from around 90,000 sentences to roughly 75,000. It is very apparent that there are some considerable differences among the parts of the data set. For example, the French decisions are quite short when compared to others. But there are also some shared similarities. For all the data sets, it holds that the analysis sentences are the most numerous, followed by the background sentences. Finally, the outcome sentences are the most rare. Except the French subset, the number of outcome sentences is considerably lower than the number of sentences of the other two types. Uh, that is for the data set, and let us move on to the models. Right, so to perform this task of segmenting the decisions into different sections, we need to develop a machine learning model. And this is a high level overview of how that model looks. Um, Hannes, I'm sorry, just to uh, uh, alert you, uh, you have four more minutes to finish this presentation and so we can open the questions, okay? Just so you know. Uh, we started late and it's... Okay, so uh, let's, <laughs> let's push more seven minutes, okay? Okay. So at the bottom here, you see um, the case um, that is first of all split into different sentences. And each of these sentences using tools such as Spacey. Um, and each of these sentences is then fed through an embedding model um, uh, that is called laser um, uh, language agnostic sentence representations that embeds these sentences into uh, an embedding space, uh, a vector of 1024 dimensions. And the, the special thing about this uh, representation is that it is um, language agnostic. So uh, these embeddings, if the, if the, content, the semantic content of the sentence is similar, they will be in a, in a similar embedding space close to each other, no matter the language. This is then fed to a gated recurrent unit by directional network. And that then for each sentence outputs a label such as the um, background, and the analysis and the outcome. Um, and this is a bidirectional model. So in making these predictions, uh, this model has uh, access to the previous and also the following sentences and their embeddings. So I then performed a number of experiments. And um, we evaluated three different hypotheses. And what they differ in is what is used as trading data, whether they're single or multiple data sets. And then we always compare them against the baseline to make sure that the, um, um, the results are strong. And then we evaluate this by looking at an F1 score. Um, and we do this, that is a harmonic mean between um, um, precision and, and uh, recall. And we do this for 10 K fold splits for each experiment to make sure that the, the model is, the results are regular. So let's start with the first hypothesis that is the out context experiment. So the question that we want to examine here is, can a model trained in a single context generalize to other contexts? So it's possible that a model can learn from one language or a jurisdiction and so on, and be successfully applied in another context. So we saw this before, where we use one single context as training data, and then we test it against another context. And we move through the different contexts this way. First, Czech Republic, and then France, and so on. And once we've done all of these, we will use a different context for training, such as the Czech Republic, and test this against another data set. And we, perform, uh, we compare this against a baseline of stratified random prediction, and that outputs uh, a random um, prediction based on the distribution of the data. And here you can see the results. So to the left here is the, the context this is trained on, and to the right is the average F1 score, and we compare it against the rest of the data sets. So the baseline gets an F1 score of about 
And all of our models actually gain an F1 score that's quite higher than this, um, between 0.60 and 0.70, um, and sometimes higher. Um, so this is, seems to be able to learn something. Um, and we've also seen that um, if data sets are similar, it seems to perform better, such as Canada and the United States. And we'll get back to this later, why this might be the case. And even the outcome section, that is much rarer than the other sections, um, is sometimes uh, works to predict using this model. So from this, I think you can take away that the models are able to transfer knowledge between different contexts, um, despite having never seen this before and being completely different languages or domains. So next, let's look at the H2 experiment, the pooled out context experiment. Um, so here, um, the question is, what if we add additional context to the training pool? Does this increase robustness? Um, as in, does it make the performance better um, when applied on unseen data sets? So whereas before, we use a single context for training and I tried it against a target data set. Um, now we use this single context plus the other context that are not part of, uh, that are not the target data set. Let's see how well this model performs. And then we move on. So for example, here we take France and then we exclude this from the training data and continue the prediction. And as a baseline here, we use the best performing out context model per context. And I want to highlight that this is quite a, a competitive baseline. Since as I mentioned before, and um, some data sets are much closer together. For example, um, Canada and the United States perform well, very well across each other. And that means, of course, that if a model is trained on Canada, this will be the best performing out context model per context for the United States. Whereas our model has many more different data sets that it needs to abstract from and, and learn this uh, to apply to this new context. And here you can see the results. So this row is for the baseline, and here we have our model. And as you can see, in, in seven out of eight cases, our model matches or improves and on this baseline. And the results that you can see are pretty high, um, usually over 0.80 and sometimes even over 0.90. And remember, this is on really unseen data. So this is something that could potentially be useful and when applied in practice and, and being used on a completely previously unseen domain. So I think from this, we can take away that training on a pool of data sets leads to more robust models um, and it leads to better adaptation to unseen contexts. And finally, we have the pooled within context experiment. So what's happening here, that the question is, does combining in context data with out context data improve performance? So whereas before we excluded um, this training data, now we add this data as well. So we use all the different contexts for training and then evaluate it against a single test context. Uh, of course, we don't use the same data. We use different folds here so that it's still never seen the, the testing data, but it has seen data from that context. And then we move through to use this to predict the different uh, target contexts. And as based on here, we use um, in context models. And um, so that is a model that has only been trained on the target context. And again, I want to highlight that this is a super competitive baseline. This is seeing the data that will be by far the most similar to the target context. And this means that the model trained on only this data should have a really good opportunity to learn the distribution there and, and, and to do that prediction. Whereas our model, of course, has eight different data sets that it needs to learn from and extract from. So um, it is quite difficult to get, get this baseline. But despite this, in, in six out of eight cases, our model outperforms this baseline. And again, um, the results are very high, often over 0.80 and often even over 0.90. So I think from this, we can take away that training on in-context data pooled with out-context data does improve performance when compared against um, this single uh, model strain or single target context. So the model does seem to be able somehow to abstract from these different data sets and take the lessons to build a stronger model. All right, let us look at some of the findings more closely. So the results from testing hypothesis one and hypothesis two strongly suggest that multilingual embeddings focus on the semantics of the sentences rather than superficial linguistic features. This is extremely important for a work like this one. It is very important that the models focus on the semantics and avoid fitting the context-specific idiosyncrasies, even though there could be they could be useful within that context. Moving on, 
we observed that some of the contexts appear to be more related amongst themselves than to other contexts. In order to get some additional insight into this phenomenon, we projected full documents into a shared semantic space. Using PCA to reduce the dimensionality to just two, we obtained this visualization where each dot represents a single document. The color encodes membership of a document in a specific context. Uh, you can see that both the USA subsets occupy virtually the same semantic space. This makes a lot of sense if you consider that the documents are written in the same language, they come from the same tradition, on top of that both subsets are focused on employment law. The German subset occupies a space in the middle, and it also appears to be a bit more dispersed than the other ones. This is likely due to the fact that it is the most general data set, not focusing on a specific topic. Of course, this is expected, and it provides grounds for future work. In this work, we did not factor the context relatedness in our experiments at all. Another interesting observation relates to structural differences in the documents. We noticed that German and Polish mod models struggle in predicting the outcomes for other subsets and the other way around. This is explained by structural differences in the documents. Whereas the German and Polish documents report the outcomes that are depicted in green, at the beginning of the decisions, the documents from other subsets tend to place these towards the end. However, it is promising that the models that have access to data with both these patterns were able to acquire them both and apply them rather successfully. To conclude, we observed that the models utilizing multilingual embeddings manifested good generalization capabilities. It appears that pooling multiple contexts together results in improved robustness and performance of the models. And it helps even when in-domain data is available. It was an extremely rewarding experience to identify a task that was relevant for researchers with different interests and was applicable in wildly different contexts. And we are really looking forward to what comes next and how the data set and the code be released is going to be used by this community. And of course, we also have some ideas of our own. While the data set is sizable, it would certainly benefit from extending it with more documents from more different contexts. We use the data in the most straightforward way here to segment the documents into parts with different function. However, this could be a useful step in many applications focused on, for example, information retrieval or summarization. In our experiments, we simply pull the data from different contexts together. Using more sophisticated approaches would be a reasonable way how to improve on this work. Uh, finally, we also anticipate that resources resulting from this type of work could be useful for gaining insights into differences and similarities among the co different contexts, akin to the structural analysis of the documents performed here. All right, that's all from us, and we are looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Yaromir. Thank you, Hans. I'm sorry again for the delay. Um, uh, I, I really liked your presentation. Um, actually, people have five minutes to, to ask, ask some questions, but I have one. I like to, I like to know um, about the, re regarding the transference of these models um, on arbitral proceedings. Can we apply or use this, this model itself in such proceedings? I mean, the, the current model was trained on, on uh, judicial proceedings from a, a really wide variety. And, and there's some um, uh, judgments in there from courts, there's some tribunals and so on. So it is really a, a wide range of data. I mean, this does suggest that this could be something that could be useful um, across such data as well. And if you look at the paper, it seems that even though there, there are completely different uh, instances involved, different types of instances, it does seem to generalize quite well. So if this kind of schema does make sense to apply on that kind of data, I think it's definitely something that would be feasible. And otherwise, I mean, as you mentioned, this is just one type of schema, but there could certainly be others that could be, be very useful, um, no matter what type of data we're looking at. Uh, to specify this answer a little bit further, so the multilingual embeddings that we use, they support almost 200 languages, and they are supposed to work to a certain extent even on languages that they were not trained on if the languages come from the same family as the languages that this was trained on. So theoretically, we could take um, a document in almost any uh, reasonable language uh, and apply it, and if the task makes sense, meaning that it's a judicial document that kind of follows this same, similar structure that we have here, it would be, it would be applicable there. Very well, very clever. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Uh, can you explain embeddings that are ling language agnostic? Is heterogeneous data being uh, homogenized, which could explain transfer learning? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think that's one of the key things here about this model is really the idea that um, it does the translation for us. So we don't even have to care about translation because what it does is it takes 
these sentences, um, no matter the language. Um, and it encodes this into this shared semantic space. Um, and in this space, and we've seen this work really well, uh, where like two sentences that are, say, in, in, in Czech or in, in German or in English, they will always end up very closely if, if the meaning behind them is very similar. I think that's one of the really powerful methods of this new deep learning paradigm where, where we can download a model like this that has been pre-trained on um, mm -hmm. almost 100 languages and, uh, and apply this on our own data and get something that is able to generalize so well across different languages. Yeah, and again, I mean, just to make the point, so, so the translation does not really happen. Like you supply the sentence in almost any language, the sentence is projected onto a vector and uh, sentence is coming from different languages. If the meaning is close, the vectors will also be close. That's how this, that's how this works. Okay. Um, um, we have uh, one last question. Um, do you think the results could be improved when using your model as an ensemble with another model that relies on the structural information like headlinks? Um, I mean, definitely, there is a lot of space for improvement. Uh, so uh, in our work, we did not really uh, drive towards like the best possible performance. Our goal really was to evaluate the capabilities of the multilingual embeddings to see if this really works in a legal context in the particular task that we were uh, that we were evaluating, uh, but th what what is being suggested here is definitely one of the one of the very promising paths towards uh, improving the performance, and we also see many other. Paths. And the, the data is there, so if someone wants to do this, we really encourage people to try this out and and, and see see how that would work. It'd be really interesting. Okay, guys. Um, so um, I think that's it for questions. Yeah, we don't have more questions. So thank you again for. For a brilliant presentation. Um, now I'd like to to ask um, um, uh, Nicholas to to, ha to have his presentation. Uh, Nicholas is going to present um, a short paper. So he has 50, uh, 15 minutes, uh, 10 minutes for presentation and five minutes for questions. Uh, the the name of his presentation of this his work is a French plumbing uh, description data to text data set for natural language generation. Um, um, Nicolas, if you could, um, if you could present yourself, please, and can, you may begin your presentation. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, I bet that you can see my presentation clearly now, right? Um, all right. Uh, so, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Nicholas, and I'm a PhD student in, uh, in Quebec City, Canada. Uh, at Laval University and hopefully I will finish my PhD uh, soon enough uh, in the next year uh, and today I'm presenting a project that we've been working on lately which is uh, plume to text and as Gabriel told it is the French uh, plumitives uh, descriptions data to text data set for natural language generation um, so I'll begin by introducing the team behind this project so there's uh, myself uh, and I work uh, closely with Eve Gaumont, who uh, is a master's student uh, in Faculty of Law, as well as Luc Lamontagne, my, uh, my supervisor, and Pierre-Luc Desiel, who uh, is the supervisor of uh, Eve Gaumont in, in the Faculty of Law. So I'll begin by introducing the, uh, the underlying task that we are trying to solve with this new data set that we, that we are introducing today. So in 2020 at INLG, the uh, International uh, Conference on Natural Language Generation, we introduced the task of generating intelligible plumitives. And by plumitive, it, uh, these are like, uh, I, I would say docket files, similar to docket files. Uh, these uh, we want to generate intelligible plumitive descriptions. And uh, in this paper, we first introduce the task and the first baseline, baseline model as I will uh, introduce uh, shortly. So just to give you a sense of what we're trying to do, uh, we have on the left here, uh, a, uh, the first page of a docket file, a primitive, which contains a different information about the accusation. And this is a, uh, this is a fake case, uh, obviously. So we have the, uh, the accused, uh, we also have a couple of charges, references to the Criminal Code of Canada, as well as the pleas. Uh, 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 sometimes we have a sentence, the decision, and, uh, and, and, and so on. So these documents are kind of cryptic, and they contain several abbreviations. 
and they are supposed to be widely accessible to the Canadian citizens, either to be uh, in the context, uh, in the edu educational context, or in some cases when uh, citizens want to represent themselves, uh, they, sh they are supposed to be, uh, uh, to, to have access to these, th this kind of document. However, there, there is a problem in, uh, in intelligibility, intelligibility problem with this document being that, uh, well, as I said, it contains a lot of references to the criminal code and a lot of abbreviations. So the goal of this project is to take into input this document and generate uh, a short description or, uh, well, translate this document into a more digestible uh, piece of text, essentially. So this is why we frame this problem into a data to text. We extract the meaningful information from the, uh, the, the docket file and generate uh, some, uh, some description uh, out of it. So the first baseline model that we introduce is, is, is based on a, a rule-based generator. So we first uh, scan through the docket file, uh, extract the different parts and normalize, uh, extract uh, the structure from this, the, this uh, denormalized document. And then giving some rules and uh, the criminal code uh, of Canada, we then generate a short summary of this uh, or short, short the description of this uh, document. Um, however, we had a couple of generalization problem with, uh, with this model because the rules have been extracted uh, first by a legal expert, but from a subset of the, uh, of the docket file. So, and a rule-based language uh, generator may be hard to maintain and even, even to build if you got to uh, have a sense of how the legal system works, what uh, abbreviations are and things like that. So we hopefully want to solve this problem or replace this rule base uh, generator by uh, some uh, deep learning uh, sequence to sequence generators. Uh, and by hopefully, I mean, um, well, we are actually testing this. Uh, and this morning I, I presented a, a model that we, we are actively working on, which is Kignal Bar. And it's a pre-trained language model that has been trained on uh, thousands of uh, judgments from the Criminal Court of Canada. So it, it grasps uh, essentially some semantics uh, from these, uh, these legal documents. Um, but in order to train such a model, we need a data set to train us. And this is why we, we, we build this data set. Uh, so we wanted to create a data set with uh, primitives docket files and their associated descriptions in order to train a, such a statistical model. And this is why we introduce uh, primitive text. So I'll present how we created this data set. Uh, and I'll first introduce the, 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 the core judgments uh, as well as the annotation tool that we developed for this. And then the outcome, which is primitive text and uh, just a really simple example uh, from the data set. So court judgments are to some extent a lengthy description of uh, the primitives. So we have uh, several pages and within these pages, we have uh, at some places uh, references to the accusations, um, the verdicts, the pleas and uh, the sentences. So uh, we can uh, create a mapping between the different sections of the primitive with for example, uh, the, the, the paragraphs within the associated judgments. So the idea is to create these associations association for every accusation. So in, in this work, we focus um, mainly on the accusations uh, and the decisions and the, the pleas, but uh, the annotation methodology and tool generalizes to uh, any other parts of the primitive. So I'll introduce the annotation tool that we developed for uh, the creation of this data set. Um, so the annotator, which were basically me uh, or Ev, uh, add an interface where on the left side, we have the set of charges that are within the primitive. And on the right side, we have every paragraphs or sections from uh, the judgment, uh, uh, the, uh, the documents. 
And so what we did is that we didn't want to skim through the whole document since it may be uh, hundreds of paragraphs. Excuse uh, so, me, excuse yeah. me, Nicholas, just to uh, alert you, we have three more minutes, okay? Uh, okay, perfect. Oh. Uh, I'll, I'll fast forward just a little. Um, so we recreated classifiers in order to uh, put at the top the relevant paragraphs and to easily associate uh, sections from the primitive with the relevant paragraphs that we wanted to, to, to keep. And then the annotator just have to save it. And then there's another interface where we, uh, we label uh, to which part of the accusation, if it's uh, the charge, if it's the plea or the decision, for example, this paragraph is referring to. And again, here we are using a really simple text classifier to pre-annotate uh, these sections and then the annotator, if the, the pre-annotation was not correct, we then uh, fix this annotation and then uh, submit and save uh, this. So these uh, really simple textual classifiers accelerate the, the annotation process uh, a lot, reducing to around two minutes per document. And originally we were talking about uh, 10 or 15 minutes, I think, per, per documents. And we essentially re reduced the number of clicks and scrolling time for the creation of this data set. So one thing that I, want, I, want, I just want to quickly mention is that we are um, de decontextualizing uh, plume to text um, in, in the sense that we are removing any sensible uh, information from this data set because we uh, really want, uh, we don't want any private information to leak uh, from this, uh, from plume to text. So we first apply an automatic depersonalization using name entity recognition models by removing names, places, organizations, and dates. Uh, we then went through the uh, thousands of examples manually to replace the names, places, and organizations that the NER model may have missed. And we also removed contextual information specific uh, to the crime that has been perpetrated. Uh, for example, assault, assault uh, his neighbor, for example, we, we, we would remove this. We also remove anything that uh, is related to gender and numbers and information describing the, vic the, the victims, obviously. We, we would remove a woman, for example, in, in this uh, piece of text. So this is a, a really simple example uh, extracted from this, this data set. So we have two charges here uh, from uh, section 320.14.1a from the criminal code and B, and we also have a verdict. And this is the associated piece of text, associate, associated description of these sections of the primitives. So this is uh, exactly how it is uh, represented into, into the, the JSON file that we release. So we have around 2,400 pairs uh, of charges uh, containing also the verdict or the pleading associated with the, with a textual description. So the data set is able to be here, available here. Uh, and if you uh, have any questions or any comments, feel free to reach out uh, either uh, by, uh, during the question. Um, uh, the question time and uh, or on any social media. So uh, just to finish off, we, we are still improving this data set by adding a little more uh, examples. And now we are actively working on training a statistical generator on this data set. And uh, I would like to thank everybody for listening and I'm happy to uh, take on the questions. Um, okay, thank you, Nicholas. Um, um, I actually enjoyed the presentation. I am curious for these uh, future updates. I just like to ask you a question. Uh, what do you believe to be the biggest issues when facing the future proceedings for the future works? Um, actually, what we are we developed uh, an eval, um, natural language generation evaluation metric because. Uh, in the case, in a legal case like this, you really don't want a statistical generation generator to generate uh, unfactual uh, piece of text. You really want it to be um, uh, aligned with the original primitives. You don't because these these kind of models are known to uh, hallucinate some things. So what we are uh, developing is a evaluation metric. However. There are still some concerns because uh, we don't want to generate some texts uh, like that won't be factual. And so 
we always consider falling back to the rule-based model, which will be really factual and will reflect uh, the, uh, the original uh, docket file. But uh, I mean, this is research and we want to push as far as we can uh, this, this statistical generation, but this is the main concern that we have actually. Very well, very well. We are still waiting on questions, but yeah. We, are, we have not received new questions here. Well, if you want to use this, this moment to maybe comment, comment on something or uh, use it a final, final time to do some last comments, maybe. Um, well, I would like to thank uh, Ev uh, and Pierre-Luc and uh, my supervisor, Luc. Uh, who work uh, closely with me on, on, on this project. And also uh, the SOCIJ, which is the Société Québécoise d'Information Juridique here in Quebec City, who provided us with the, uh, the data sets uh, and the task actually. So we are closely working with them. And hopefully this tool is gonna help uh, a lot of Canadian or Quebec uh, citizens in order to, uh, well, our main goal is to provide a layer of access to the judicial, judicial system. So uh, hopefully this is gonna be used by the government uh, because we really, really believe that it's gonna be useful for uh, not only the lawyers, uh, but also uh, people that are facing the judicial system. Very well, Nicholas. Thank you for our presentation. Um, now I'd like to call Adriana Ung uh, for, for her presentation. On, on the theme um, on the theme of um, the name of her paper is process mining enable jury metrics an analysis of a Brazilian court's judicial performance in the business law processing um, uh, Adriana you have um, uh, 10 minutes to your presentations and then we'll finish with five uh, minutes for Q and a and um, and um, Present yourself, please, and start your presentation. Yo. Okay. Hi, Gabriel. Uh, I am Adriana Unger. I am a PhD student from University of Sao Paulo in Information Systems. And I will share my screen here. Can you see? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, hello, everyone. I will present the paper Process Mining Enable Jury Metrics, which is a joint research between the Process Mining Research Group at University of Sao Paulo and the Brazilian Jury Metrics Association. In this paper, we present a proof of concept for the application of process mining to the analysis of judicial performance of the Court of Justice of the State of Sao Paulo in Brazil, considering the processing of lawsuits in the business law. Well, uh, improving judicial performance is increasingly relevant to guarantee access to justice. If we consider the current judicial setting, we can see that high litigation rates challenge judicial systems all over the world. Uh, litigation rate is the ratio of new lawsuits each year to the population. In Brazil, we have high litigation rates combined to high volume of ongoing lawsuits resulting in a heavy workload in the judiciary. At the same time, we notice an increasing use of technology to support lawsuit processing. Not only electronic lawsuits emerged, but also management information systems that record every procedural act performed inside the courts. The Court of Justice of Sao Paulo, which is the subject of our study, is considered the largest court in the world with over 19 million ongoing lawsuits. All lawsuits in this court are born digital since 2015 and are managed by the ESAG Justice Automation System. Concerning judicial performance, it's a field of study dedicated to evaluating performance of judicial systems. And we remark that most judicial performance studies focus on global measure of court performance or comparison between courts. As an example, we can see the values of IPC Jus Index for each Brazilian state court, 
IPC JUS is the Comparative uh, Justice Productivity Index, which summarizes and compares the productivity and relative efficiency of courts in Brazil. Such index guides the measurement of judicial performance, but it is not so helpful to diagnose lawsuit processing issues or to guide improvement actions. Another important field of study is jury metrics, which is the application of statistics to law. Jury metrics is not new, but is becoming more relevant due to the increasing availability of judicial data. Many jury metrics techniques are used to improve the practice of law, including judicial performance. Here we can see a recent study from the Brazilian Jury Metrics Association on the specialization of courts of law. However, these studies are based on a data-oriented perspective. Considering lawsuit processing, we see an opportunity for jury metrics to consider the procedural nature of lawsuits. In this sense, uh, process mining offers an innovative approach to analyze judicial data from a process-oriented perspective. Process mining is a new field of study that enables event logs to be mined into process models that help to understand operational processes in organizations. In our work, basic elements of the event log were mapped to their counterparts in the procedural law domain. Each lawsuit represents a case in process mining, and every time a lawsuit progress occurs, this movement is registered in the court management system. Each movement corresponds to an activity of the process, and the date when it is occurred uh, is considered as the activity timestamp. Process discovery algorithms build process maps from event logs, which in our work reveal the sequence of activities that were performed during the processing of lawsuits inside the court. Process analysis can then be applied to support performance improvement of the process, which includes identifying bottlenecks, reducing costs, lead times, and error rates. In our study, we show the application of process mining to analyze judicial performance based on an event log created from a lawsuit data set, which was extracted from the court information system. Well, regarding our research method, we adapted a process mining project methodology to the analysis of lawsuit processing, and the study was restricted to business law and considered the complete log of almost 5,000 lawsuits from the Court of Justice of Sao Paulo, including additional case attributes for process analysis. We used the Brazilian process mining tool Everflow to perform process mining of this event log. As a result, we performed analysis based on four perspectives. The first one is the control flow perspective, which generated the process map for the lawsuits that we analyzed, including the calculation of the main process metrics. This process maps also highlights the most frequent activities and transitions of the process. And the view is user interactive so that activities, transitions, and the time interval can be selected and filtered for drill down analysis. The complexity and procedural viscosity of lawsuits in business law was confirmed by the average rate of more than 55 movements per lawsuit and the average lawsuit duration of almost one year. The process map can also be presented using the average duration matrix, which leads us to the time perspective of process mining. In this case, highlights in the process model review bottlenecks activities and the slow transitions during the processing of lawsuits. As an example, a slow transition was found between issued publication certificate movement and suspension of the term movement which duration of 21 days and affecting more than 40% of lawsuits in the data set. This bottleneck is possibly due to litigant issues, such as lack of required documentation and causes an increase of almost 80% in the lawsuit duration. 
Concerning the reserves perspective, we consider process analysis based on the ruling judge of each lawsuit. In our data set, efficiency metrics were similar among all the judges involved, suggesting that the root causes of inefficiencies in the processing of business law are not related to the judge. Since we have a case attribute in our data set that indicates whether each lawsuit is digital or not, in the case perspective, we performed a comparative analysis of on paper and digital lawsuits. Surprisingly, we found that on paper lawsuits are faster than the digital ones. We raised some hypotheses to explain this. One of them, considering that the main process bottlenecks in business law are related to internal activities that are independent on the digital nature of the lawsuits, hiding other inefficiencies usually associated to on paper lawsuits. Using process mining, it's possible to compare not only the main process metrics, but the detailed flow in each situation. As a conclusion, we argue that process mining offers benefits of a process-oriented approach to analyze judicial data for performance diagnostics, providing insights into the root causes of inefficiencies so that actions to resolve them can be defined. We also prospect the use of process mining to provide online dashboards for continuous judicial performance monitoring. Uh, we would like to kindly thank Kleber Stroh from the Everflow company for supporting this research. And I would like to thank everyone that's here today. It's an honor for me to present this work, being one of the few Brazilian researchers in this ICAO conference. So, muito obrigada. Thank you, Adriana, for your presentation. Um, uh, the, the time to, for questions uh, is, is now, it's open. I would like to ask a question, actually. Um, could you, um, actually, uh, currently, as you said, in Brazil, one of the biggest discussions uh, regards the legal uncertainty by the judicial branch, mainly in superior courts. But how can we separate those controversial decisions and still prevent the bias from that mechanical separation to appear in the results? Thank you so much. <laughs> well, uh, in this work, we, we didn't focus on solving a, a, a legal problem uh, during the, the processing of lawsuits. Uh, we actually wanted to show that uh, process mining can enable a lot of analysis that are uh, really difficult to do today. And I think that uh, I, I don't know exactly the, the we didn't study the, the superior courts and the loss of processing in these courts, but uh, I'm pretty sure that if you analyze uh, each activity of the, the processing of lawsuits in these courts, and if you uh, 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 apply the, the process mining algorithms, algorithms to group and to identify bottlenecks and things like that, I'm sure that you can uh, identify uh, lots of uh, uh, room for improvement there. Okay, okay. We, we don't have um, any more questions for now. Um, uh, people, if you wish to ask something, um, feel free to do so. Uh, uh, during, while we wait, um, Adriana, if you could maybe um, say a few words, uh, comment on something you'd like to comment or thank someone, I don't know. Okay, I would like to thank my supervisors, uh, Marcelo Fontinato and Sarajani Perez from uh, University of Sao Paulo. Uh, I would like to thank my colleague in this, uh, in this paper, Jose Francisco. And I would like to thank very much the Julio Trescente and Renata from the Brazilian Geometrics Association. Uh, this research would not be possible with the collaboration of everyone. Okay. Well, um, Adriana, thank you for your presentation. Um, we have not received any more questions. We can wait a little bit on that. So if anybody uh, still have questions, now is the time. Um, well, I, I, I might say that uh, if uh, I will be on the Gather Town platform, so if anybody has uh, some more questions or need to know 
want to know more about process mining, I'll be there. Yeah, yeah. Actually, this is a very, very good reminder, Adriana. We have Gather Town people. There's um. There's a social platform on which we, we do some interactions. You can talk to people who, who, who have has presented papers. Um, you can talk to our sponsors too. Um, you can talk to us on the organization. Is the method we found to be a nearer from you uh, during this pandemic um, scenario. So if you can at some time join there, the, the room is always open. So um, there, during the breaks, we will be there to talk to you um, and people may, may join a gather town. So I'd like to show everyone how, uh, how it's done. How, how can you uh, enter gather town? So could maybe, um, I'll share my screen here while, since we have some time left, I'll share my screen here. Okay, okay, here. So I believe you can see my screen right here, right? So what we do is we click here on Gather Town, and then you'll be um, you'll be sent to this page. And what you need to do is you can just click the link, unfortunately, but you can copy it and then paste it on your on your um, browser. Okay, I'll show you. And then you can access, uh, you do go continue on browser, join the gathering. You can have your avatar, um, um, you can change your avatar and then you can walk around. And when you get near other avatars, other people, you can talk to them just like in, in real life. So we have some games in here. Oh my God, oh my God. I'm not going to talk to anybody now. Um, you have some games here in here you can chat to um, have some doubts we have our sponsor stands here they are available all the time to all the time or most of the time to have some to um, answer questions and well i just wanted to to show you how we we are doing things here on gather town um and ask you to go on and and invite you to go on there and um have some fun there actually thank you again um, well, uh, in name of the organization, the, the IKL organization, I'd like to thank uh, all the attendees and all the presenter, the paper presenters to, uh, in this panel and of all the others. And once again, uh, thank our, our sponsors for, for all the help. Um, they have been very, very important to us to make this possible. And um, I'll see you tomorrow. See you, see you all tomorrow. I hope you.